Welcome to The Collector's House, a Matches Fashion Podcast. I'm Danielle Rudeutschen. Each episode features a conversation with a creative mind about the things that inspire them or that have given their life meaning in some way. From books, to art, to a piece of jewellery, these objects are collected into a cabinet which resides in physical form in the attic at 5 Carlos Place, the Matches Fashion Townhouse in London. On this episode, my guest is the designer Haider Ackerman. Born in Colombia and raised in France, he studied at the prestigious Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Antwerp and set up his fashion label in 2001. Based in Paris, he creates both men's and women's wear with a devoted clientele who are drawn to his long sinuous lines and elegant draping. Speaking to me remotely over the internet, he told me about the things he would put into his imaginary cabinet of curiosities at Five Carlos Place, the allure of the face mask, and where he'd have his dream birthday party. Hi, Haida. Hi, Danielle. It's so nice to talk to you on the podcast. Mm-hmm. wanted to have you on this recording for ages, and I'm really excited it's finally happening. Now, we are speaking to each other today on the, on the 21st of July uh, at the tail end or in the midst probably of the COVID-19 crisis, um, which means we are doing this recording remotely. Where are you? Um, in the office, barricading <laughs> myself. In Paris? In Paris, yeah. In beautiful, sunny Paris. Yeah. Which was... which. Um, I have to say it's been a wonderful time to be in Paris while all this was going on because the city was so empty and deserted and absolutely amazing to wander the streets and, uh, and to, to feel this kind of loneliness in Paris. It's, it's beautiful. I mean, then it reflects the, the grace of the beauty, the grace of the city. Amazing. That's really interesting. You sort of answered my first question there because I know that you, are, you like to travel and I was wondering whether this period of induced lockdown had made you travel more in your imagination or how you'd sort of been feeding that. It was very, I enjoyed that period so much. I mean, the boredom and the silence and all of this is very beneficial. It's um, the fact that you just have time to to think and to question yourself and to question wherever you would like to go or wherever you don't want to go anymore. And, um, and we know we, we, we never have time to stand still. So this absolutely boredom, it's, uh, it's been for me, it, it gave me more energy and more inspiration than before. Yeah, so I pretty much very much enjoyed the spirit. Now, have you ever been to Five Carlos Place, the Matches Fashion Townhouse in Mayfair in London? No, I haven't been. I've heard much about it, but I haven't been yet. yet. Well, I hope one day we, you can go and I'll see you there. Um, there is a cabinet in the attic there. And we link that cabinet to this podcast by asking the guest on the podcast what they put in there to sort of represent them as a sort of cabinet of curiosities. And so I was wondering, what was the first thing that you'd put in there to represent you? Well, you know, it, it was very, it's a difficult question because um, strangely, and perhaps due to my upbringing, I've never been, um, let's say, a materialistic person. So I, I, don't, um, I don't have objects around me. I don't have, um, I like when things are very the emptiness, you know, I think our life is quite busy enough and we get so many information and we have so many things to deal with so that the emptiness and it gives me kind of space. And um, so I was wondering what, what I eventually would put there and it would be perhaps more words or, or, or text or perfume on my glasses that I don't wear now, but um, those kind of things, which are things that you can carry with you whenever you're on the road. Because um, as you know, standing still, and I do live in Paris for quite a while, but 
due to my childhood, I had this nomadic life that we were always on the road. So you, you carry your heart with you and all your belongings. So that's what I would put in this um, over there. Speaking of your upbringing, you were born in Colombia and adopted and raised by French parents. And going back to this theme of travel, your father was a map maker. And there's this lovely romantic theme of travel which weaves through your life. Um, his, your father, he took you and your siblings, both of whom were also adopted, traveling around North Africa. How did this experience form you creatively? You, you know, when you, you are so... When you're young, you're not aware of what you're living and you don't see the luxury that your parents are giving you by throwing all those images at you. It's only later when you start, when I start to be interested in, not in fashion, but in fabrics in the first place. Because my childhood was only about movements. We were living in Ethiopia and you had this woman in Bubu, so those endless dresses which are reaching the sun, like, Giacometti sculptures, um, you know, th those were my first visions of a woman. And then we moved to Chad and then we moved to Algeria where they were like, like um, ghosts, like walking in the Medina because they all had white veils. So fabric was my first, I was always curious to try to discover what would be underneath those meats of fabrics. And if I would do fashion, would I understand a woman more than I did when I was young? I still don't, but <laughs> that's probably the beauty of it. Um, but yeah, all, all, all those images uh, of those meats of fabric is what seduced me to try to do the job that I'm doing now. Do you still yeah. have any of the maps from your father? No, I don't. I don't. You know, when you... As I said previously, when you tr travel that much, you just leave things behind. And which is a good thing to leave things behind because the important is what's, um, what your memory is capturing. All those total moments that you keep in your head, those are the ones that you should take along on your road. You studied at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Antwerp. Um, which is a highly prestigious place to go. It's the alma mater of Margiela, Dries van Noten, and de Moylemeester. I, I was struck exactly. by a quote by you that, in which you said that, they, that at the Royal Academy, they teach you to respect women and to think a lot about how women wear clothes. Um, and to your mm -hmm. point that you made just now about the women in Ethiopia, um, I was wondering why you thought that was so important and whether, I mean, is it not a given that male designers will respect women and think about how they wear clothes? No, because, oh, I'm sorry to say not immediately. <laughs> I should not say that. But um, no, because a male designer always has a fantasy how a woman should be or how a woman should dress. And it's, there's lots, often there's lots of, used to be in the past, lots of decoration, lots of going on. And the, the also, due, due to where I was coming from, first in Africa, where the woman was so underneath a chador, it was an orgy of colors and gold, and, and it was opulent, and it, it was a madness of all of that. Coming from there, moving to Holland, and then sending Belgium, where it's very austere and very reserved, and it was all very about the nobleness of, of a woman. To have that contradiction from my past, that clash was very, very interesting. So I was learning about a different kind of respect from the woman, where it's not about being in the middle of the crowd and capturing all the light, but the discretion and the elegance of the dis discretion. And that's what uh, Miss Margiela did perfectly. Susie Menkes called you one of the best fashion colorists since Yves Saint Laurent. How do you approach color in your designs? Well, you know, at the beginning, it, it, it depends, you know, it depends from periods. Um, I think that when one is in love, you're more generous with your color because you want to reach out to people. You just more, you just want more to share. So your colors might be more intense, more rich, 
Um, so it, it, it all very much depends on your mood. <laughs> it sounds a little bit bad. But yeah, the rich stuff color, yeah. I think that the most colorful collections have been periods that was the most in love. Because you just you have this generosity towards people. Which colors represent love to you? Mm, imperial blue, which is a kind of midnight blue, because there's an intent, there's a richness, there is a deepness, there is a intensity, there is, um, and you can just, yeah, there's a whole landscape in front of you. Yeah. It's a kind of Prussian blue, very, very intense, yeah, very beautiful. And you're also known for the for the cut and the drape of your clothing, also for the long skinny scarf, and it's a sort of very long, elegant, slouchy silhouette. Can you talk mm -hmm. a bit more about your aesthetic approach to clothes, particularly in regards to it being adaptable to men and women? But like, for instance, when you, we speak about scarves, scarves is something that I would, um, that I would put in my box of curiosity because a scarf is something that I've been always wearing. Um, it's a part of me because, first of all, I always love the gesture when either man or woman wears a scarf. Um, certainly a woman, the way she, she folds her hands to the back, there is always a kind of beauty to it. Um, then secondly, as I'm quite a shy person, I like to hide behind scarf. It's something, it, it, it's a hiding, it makes me feel more secure. There's something protective about it. Um, I used to make lots of scarves in, in, in Yak, and that was coming from the Hangzhou region in China. Um, I loved it because for a thousand years ago, only the emperor was allowed to wear them. So there's something very aristocratic and very mysterious about it. So. Yes, the scarf is absolutely, it, it, it gives a kind of nonchalance, but a kind of noblesse to a silhouette. Whatever you wear, it just gives this kind of noblesse. I think it's quite beautiful. But it, for me, it was a lot about protection and about covering my shyness. How do you feel about wearing a face mask when you're out and about in Paris? Oh, I do. I do. I, I, well, we, we have to in the first place. It would be rather stupid not to do it. Um, and which is really, really funny, or which is very intriguing, is when you're walking down the street, you connect people with the eyes. It's not that there's more flirtations going on, but people are now looking at each other in the eyes. Before you would look toward the face, but now there's something about the eyes. So it's not really flirtatious, but there's something very mystical about it. I, I really enjoy that. <laughs> Just going back to um, what I was trying to say earlier about clothes for women and for men, um, you joined many other houses um, a few years ago by deciding to combine your men's and women's collections into one presentation. There are obviously lots of practical considerations for doing this. Um, but is it also partly because you believe that men and women should and can be can wear the same clothes well you know there's something the the sharing of clothes with your partner there is something quite sexual about it um when a woman's wear the pillowcase of a man it gives her something quite negligé some something quite you don't know where she spent the night before you don't know what she's been up to uh, did she come out straight out of bed? Um, what has she been doing? So there's a lot of questions going on about this, which I really like. And, and the same, you have men versus women when, when they wear a pullover and it's just a little too narrow and a little too tight. And it might give us something like a little bit more edgy and more rock and roll. But just the idea to, to carry the perfume of the other and, and, and perfume is one of the big things for me as well. That's what I will put also in the curiosity. Um, box is, is perfume because that's what it means to you. It's a part of you. It, um, you, you recognize the person even though the person is not there. So it, um, it makes you travel with your mind. So yeah. yeah. And, and to, to put women and men together to get back there, it's just 
It was not done for me, first of all, of practical reasons. It's that I like the exchange. I like, I like the backstage when the girls and the boys are together because there's sensuality, there's sexuality going on there. There's more energy going on there. There's flirtations going on there. So it brings the energy and, and the man will, standing along the woman, gives her kind of attitude and, and gives her kind of strength and force. And I like that. Talking, thinking about your perfume for the, your cabinet of curiosities, is there a particular scent that you are drawn to or are there, do you tend to wear several different perfumes depending on your mood or the time of year? And I'm quite a faithful person. So I've been having the, the same one for the last 10 years, I think. Um, it, it's one which is, which is called Poivre de Samarcande. And Samarcande, it's a, it's a city in Ubediskan. And that's where um, it was a silk route, uh, which was leading from uh, China to the eastern countries. Um, and it's from Hermès. And it's, it's um, well, I like the idea of the whole silk route. When, when I was younger, I read that book by Alessandro Barico, which is called Seta. And it was also all about his traveling and all about discovering from what's happening in Japan to move it here to, to our country. So, so it's very Papa-like. It's, um, it's a good one. Yeah. Nice. So we put your book into your cabinet as well, along with the Hermes perfume and your glasses. And a scarf. And, and, and songs. You have to put songs in the songs? Oh, dear, there are many of them. But if I had to choose, it's kind of difficult to choose one song when you just, but if I had to choose one, it's, um, it might be Leonard Cohen. Um, I'm your man. Um, because if you say, if you want a lover, I'll do anything you ask me to. There's something, I mean, the generosity of the song, the lyrics of the song, there's something really very intense. It's like not being scared to put yourself totally naked in front of the person and just use me because I'm your lover and I will do anything you ask me to. I will put a mask, whatever. I reach out my hand to you. And to have this vulnerability, and at the same time, standing out there in full force, in full strength, there's something very sexual about it. So, yeah, probably would be one of the songs that I would put out there. It's so funny mm. hearing you talk about love and sexuality, because I have to be honest with you, I've never really associated you as a designer with sexy clothing. Am I, am I wrong? No, but I don't think that the clothing... Sexy clothing is not something that, that, that it's really seductive. I mean, it's more the gesture and the attitude of the person which, and her words and her thinking and, and the movement that will make the person sexy. Um, the clothes don't do it. Now I have to talk about the um, significant relationship with celebrities that has come to be associated with your name over the years. Um, Kanye, of course, was known to be very keen on your jogger, your sweatpants and your hoodies. Um, and you have a strong, um, famous friendship with Tilda Swinton, who is a very vocal fan of yours. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the celebrity endorsement? Is it, I mean, it must be effective, but is it something you're comfortable with? You know, it, it, it's just a question of relationship. Um, I have a very close relationship with Tilda Swinton and another one with Timothée Chalamet. And uh, those are more, you know, it's more like play companions. They have their work to do. I have my work to do. Sometimes we both, we all anxious and nervous about the work and just, we just get together and, and talk about what we would like to do. And um, probably Tilda feels protected and comforted in my clothes when she has to be on the red carpet. There's 15 years of friendship there. So it's just, it, you know what? It's just a beautiful story of companionship. And, uh, and that's wonderful to, to have this kind of honesty towards each other, to have this kind of um, faithfulness. In, in this world where everybody jumps from one to the other, I like the continuity of a relationship. Um, and I like the fact that we have to get a story to tell. And that's, um, 
And I love the fact that I'm surrounded by her and by Timothy. It's not, it's not, it's not bad. Trust me. It really becomes as well a family affair. It's just a, a story that you tell together, and um, and that's interesting. And you are there to protect each other and to love each other and to build and to create something together. Yeah. Um, you most you you put Timothy in a grey tuxedo at the Venice Film Festival last year, and it broke the internet. Yes. I certainly, certainly, seriously did not expect Really? This. No, I, I did not. Uh, it, it came around that um, Timote wanted, to open the, uh, wanted me to open the film festival of Venice with him on his premiere. Um, and I was wondering what I should do. And, and I had done him previously for the Golden Globes in white. We had done black. I thought we should not put him in a bright color because he had won so many prints previously. And there is so much attention about this young man that um, the dude certainly did not need more than himself. So I, I, I suggest him to be very discreet and to just put himself gray um, because there's something that I find beautiful to Venice. Um, this timeless, uh, certain, a certain kind of, of elegance, a certain kind of freedom, um, that he feels free not to wear the perfect tuxedo. He's a young dude, so he should, he should just let himself go. So I suggest him gray and, uh, and we put the tuxedo band over the place and, and there we went, not knowing what would happen. No. Was there a um? Did you, do you notice an uptick in sales on your on the suit or of clothing when something like that happens? Well, yeah, yeah. People really request that suit, <laughs> <laughs> but you know that that's something I, it's which I'm I'm really happy about. Of course, it's it's a it's a massive compliment, and at the same time, I I love to have done this one shot. I love to do this for him. It it is a special moment, special occasion. And it's his. So to have a replica or, yeah, to have other people wearing it, 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 it touches me less, of course. But I, yeah. I suppose <laughs> what, what I feel when I see your celebrities wearing your clothes, it feels like it's something they would have chosen themselves to wear rather than being put in it by a stylist. Yeah, but I think that's very important. That, that's the relationship is important. Therefore, the companionship is important that you discuss to each other. I would not like them to feel dressed up as it would not belong to them. Uh, that would be a wrong message to send out. Certainly nowadays, you just want to, you just want to stand there. You don't, you, you know, we live in, we live in a period also where there's this whole young generation of kids who are standing up for their own. Um, as the Black, Life, Black, Life, Black Lives Matter movement, there are so many movements. You had the Emma Gonzalez in back in the days. Um, you had this wonderful activist, which was uh, Yusuf, Ay, Yusuf Sai. And all those, this young generation is standing up for their own right and for being whoever they want to be in their beliefs and everything. So I think it's very important that Whatever person you dress up, you don't disguise them. They have something to say. And certainly the person that I'm surrounded with have something to say. <laughs> now, we're going to be closing your cabinet of curiosity soon. Is there anything else you want to add to it? We could talk about Dorothy Parker. Okay. We, would always put the, we would always put the book of Dorothy Parker. We would always talk about... Um, her references to love and the sarcastic side of it and um and there again it, it, it it's so actual when she say uh i am whatever i am and i don't give it damn. I, I don't remember the phrase exactly um i should find them again but it's it's just very she wrote this so many years ago and it's very actual about what we are standing for now and where we should fight for you know, we should more fight for our beliefs and for more fight for humanity and for everything. So, yeah, of course, she would be in it. Dorothy when did you Parker. discover Dorothy Parker? What age? Do you remember? 
Oh my God, I must have been 17, I, 16, 17, yeah. And it was, you know, in those days when you are quite tormented and shared this beautiful poem about suicide, how she could commit suicide and on all the face of it. It was fantastic. <laughs> Not very optimistic, but quite beautiful. There, there was all, always a kind of irony to it, which, uh, which is very seductive. And then finally, um, you've got some big anniversaries coming up, I think. Um, you've been designing your own label for is it nearly 20 years? Yeah. Nearly. <laughs> Very successfully. Um, and I think that you yourself, I hope you don't mind me flagging this, but you turn 50 next year. Oh, wow. You're going <laughs> hard for now. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, forgive me, I hope, you know, I hope you're not someone who minds me mentioning that, but I was just wondering about how, if you've been thinking about these things and what they mean, are you and are you going to be celebrating in any way? No, I, I don't. I, I'm, I'm not crazy about anniversary, um, although my friends will tell you the opposite. Um, as every year we celebrate my birthday in a different country. So it's a, it's, it's a group of friends and we're 20 and everyone's coming from a little bit everywhere. And we only see each other for my birthday. So they see each other only for my birthday, which is funny. And it's been in Marrakesh, it's been in Rome, it's been in Lisbon, it's been in, in the countryside in England. So everywhere, every year somewhere else. Um, this year we missed out because we were locked in. Um, but I only do this to bring people together and just spend time together. And that's quite important because when you spend a whole long weekend with each other, you, it's not just a dinner. So yes, I, I like to celebrate those moments with my friends, but for the rest, no, I do not like to celebrate birthdays and I don't like to look back and I just like to look ahead of me and in front of me. Is there somewhere in particular you'd like to go to celebrate your next birthday? Um, yes, it, it would be in a desert. Yeah. It would be in desert that we all would be in desert without any Wi-Fi and just have for three days a massive party going on and dancing under the stars, pushing the stars away. That would be quite a good thing to do. That sounds amazing. <laughs> all right. Well, Haida, thank you so much for talking to me today. And I... Look forward to meeting you in person, hopefully, next time at Five Carlos Place. That would be very soon, no? Let's hope. Let's hope we're opening the borders again and we can travel and all see each other and, um, and continue like we did before. That would be great. See you soon. That was an episode of The Collector's House, a Matches Fashion podcast. You can find more episodes and more about Five Carlos Place on the Matches Fashion website. And you can join the conversation on social media by searching for at Matches Fashion, at Matches Fashion Man and the hashtag Five Carlos Place. Thanks for listening.